Good morning. Morning, Ben. How are you? Good. How are you? Never better. What a beautiful day. Honestly, the sun is shining. The plants are growing. I got most of my plants in the ground now. I don't know. Life is good. Life is good. I was just dropping uh, Peter, my son, off at daycare, and I was thinking, you know, the whole month of June should be a stat holiday. Just every day of it. <laughs> yeah. Close the I'm banks, sure. close the schools. Yeah. Employers should really thank you for that idea. You should you should run for parliament. And propose it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure the big funders would be lining up. Yeah, yeah. Speaking speaking of your son, I found I found this picture this morning. Oh, thanks. That's very discreet. I have to give you credit. Uh, it, that could be you. That could, could be, be you me. at one. That could easily be you. I don't mean now, but no, not now. That's Thirty true. years ago. And he just celebrated a birthday recently. Isn't that sweet? He's one. He's one. Yeah, I got to get you an updated picture. He's growing. That'd be good. Yeah. So uh, we're here to talk about um, veggie gardening. And I don't know who all is with us, but I understand there's a bit of an audience. And so uh, to the people listening, don't hesitate to ask questions. I think Dad and I are just going to use this opportunity to talk about what we're doing in our veggie gardens um because it's local food week and you know there is no food more local than the food that you grow in your own backyard so what a way to celebrate getting out there dad you're 100 percent finished planting are you your audio's off dad no i can't hear you you seem to have muted yourself mm. So he, oh, there's Jennifer Mitchell of the Ontario Bean Growers. Good morning, Jennifer. Jennifer is a very passionate gardener in Harriston, Ontario. Uh, Jennifer, are you trying your tomato crop again this year? I know last year Jennifer was doing tomatoes. We were talking about that. Oh, we seem to have completely and totally lost that. <laughs> So, um, oh, there he is. Is that any better? Yeah, that's better. What happened? Okay. You know, Big shrug. Well, that's what to... you do down here, you know, and to the hard drive. I don't okay. know. Oh, just, okay. To just, the hard just, drive. Sure. I just well, uh, we'll send that one over to IT department. <laughs> yeah, right. My, uh, my IT department's sitting right here. Uh -huh. uh, fast asleep on the couch. So there you go. <laughs> um, so Jen's doing Roma tomatoes this year. You're gonna make some tomato sauce, Jen. It's a good sauce tomato. So Dad, Jen is with the Ontario Bean Growers, who are sponsors of this whole affair and wow. friends of mine as an Ontario bean guy. Um, mm. So yeah, Jen, Jennifer started growing tomatoes in the last couple of years, and so. She's just telling us about the sauce tomatoes that she's growing. So, Dad, back to what you were saying. You've got your veggie garden fully planted? No, not well, not quite. Um, I but but I'm ninety five percent of the way there. I actually went out and bought a bunch of seeds, and um, then I'm I put on my jeans, the ones I was wearing in the garden the other day, and I found this in my in my pants in the pocket, and you know I realized I have partial packets of seed around which raises question about succession planting and yes. uh, beans are a good example of succession planting because and by that i mean bush beans not necessarily the beans that you are growing for cullen's foods black white and red um a, a bush bean or a french erigo uh, bean um uh i i plant two weeks apart three or four planting so i've got two in now ben um I'll, I'll finish this packet probably next week and do another partial row and then i'll do another one in uh, july maybe the second week of july um so certain plants like that uh really lend themselves to succession planting i'm on my third crop of radishes by the way good good well and you're right about the beans because fresh beans you want to it's actually a pretty short harvest window to get good crunchy, fresh tasting beans that don't get woody, right? 
And that's, uh, yeah, that's true. But you know, there is a secret to that. And that is keep picking, keep, even if you don't use them, keep picking because that little bush is just dripping with beautiful, long, soft, young beans will keep producing long, soft. I said soft, but not so soft, the kind of crunchy, tender, uh, crunchy beans will keep doing that as long as you don't allow the bean to actually mature and start to get kind of woody. Yeah. And that's what you have to do. You have it, you have to just keep picking. And if you can't eat them fast enough, give them away. Put them in the compost if you have to, but keep picking. And the difference then is maybe a one week harvest window versus a two week harvest window. And even more, I've had I've I've had a great crop off a bean plant for more than two weeks where you know you just keep keep harvesting. That's words to live by. Words to live by, keep harvesting. I like that. I like that. Well, I, I'm a little embarrassed. I just realized you can see some of the stuff behind me we haven't unpacked. For the folks who are watching this, I recently moved, and um, I clearly haven't settled in yet with the boxes everywhere. And uh, moving and starting a new garden from scratch is its own exercise. So mm. ours has been an interesting year in the garden because uh, we moved April 25th. And which meant I didn't get a chance to start my own seedlings this year, which is embarrassing. But, you know, it's good to have friends. I have friends. And uh, my friend uh, Elizabeth from the Master Gardeners in Guelph dropped off some tomato seedlings for me, which I've transplanted and put in. And for my beans, you know, Cullen's Foods is a sponsor of the Garden in a Box program. If you got a Garden in a Box box, you would have got some Cullen's beans to plant. Um, I got friends who grow lots of beans now they're not the fresh beans that dad's talking about obviously kidney beans navy beans black beans all grown here in ontario all ours are organic and um those are going in in the next week or two actually so um the the edible bean crop farmers kind of like it it's a relatively short crop um they'll go in in the next week after the corn and soy are already in and then uh, of course we don't do harvest windows because we dry them down and that's what you can do the exact same thing with the beans that were in your garden in a box box, you can let them dry down on the plant um, and then you can store them over the winter. And uh, depending on the fall that we have, now this is the thing that's a little touch and go about edible beans. And Jennifer, who's of the Ontario Bean Growers, knows all about this. <clears throat> if we have a really wet fall, you're probably not going to get your beans dry enough to store. They'll be around a 25% moisture on a, in a wet fall. But you can pick them and shell them and you can dry them down. Um, on the lowest setting in the in the oven. The trick is not to over dry them because then they get just like gravel and you can never rehydrate them. You can never cook them, make them tender again. But that ideal moisture range, if it would be great if everybody had a moisture meter, but uh, that ideal moisture range is sort of in the 15% window for, for those beans so that you can store them or you can pressure can them, which obviously is what I do. I pressure can them and sell them. So, hey, uh, whatever you want to do, but uh, that is the difference. And it is a good time of year to be planting these things. I'm well, then if you over dry them, aren't they perfect for a pea shooter? Yeah, that's right. You could put them in your BB gun. They'll shatter on the way out. <laughs> you a BB gun. Pea shooter. I, when I was a kid, I always had a pea shooter and I had two sisters. So I had a target. It worked, <laughs> out, worked out really well. <laughs> they don't let you do that anymore. I bet they don't. There's a lot of stuff we did that you kids never did. We played with firecrackers when we were 10 years old, too. I bet you didn't. No, not under your supervision. <laughs> That's because I learned I learned better. <laughs> so Jennifer is saying she planted her navy beans last weekend. They should be popping up this weekend, assuming we get enough sun. And that's funny. The question is always sun or rain. In southern Ontario, nobody's complaining about a dry spring, that's for sure. It's been pretty no. wet around here. But my question then is about heat. What about heat units? You farmers talk about heat, heat units. How important are they? Well, I mean, I'm not a farmer, but the farmers that I work with, um, certainly it's it's a factor. The, the concern with the edible beans is if it gets too hot during the flowering stage. So this is the other reason why uh, they hold off a bit before planting the kidney beans, navy beans, black beans, is that if you're... Plants are flowering, and this is difficult for field crops because there's really nothing you could do about it when you've got, you know, 50 acres in the ground. 
But if you if you hit the flowering stage during a hot drought, the flowers can wither and it's really going to affect your pod set and your yield. Now, if you're in the garden, uh, you can try and protect with a shade cloth or by watering them down a bit. Um, but it is a concern. So that that hot, hot heat, um, when does that going to come? Mid to early mid Ju July. Um, you're kind of hoping you kind of miss that. But anyway, so something to consider. Heat units are definitely a factor. But yeah, heat is energy. So um, if you get it evenly throughout the season, you get a nice big healthy plant with a high yield. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel Coles, what other crops are great to succession plant? That's a great question. Uh, personally, I would say any of your leaf crops like kale and lettuce, uh, salad mixes. Um, what else? You know, actually, people don't always do it, but I think tomatoes are a really good crop for succession planting. Now, you would have wanted to start that a while ago so that you can transplant seedlings at different stages of maturity. If you're growing tomatoes, you know, often they all come at once and you can only eat so many tomatoes, which is why this is where Jennifer is really, really smart. I, I encourage people to plant more and more paste tomatoes so that they can make sauce and enjoy it throughout the year because the fresh tomato season generally comes all at once. Um, and uh, as much as we love tomato sandwiches, you end up with cankers uh, if you really knock yourself out. So what else would you... What else would you uh, recommend? Matt? So, you know, the brief answer to that question would be anything that is short season grown from seed lends itself to succession planting. So mm -hmm. beets, for instance, carrots would be another. Um, uh, any, anything that I plant from seed that, uh, that gives me some space at the bottom end of the season in the late summer and fall to add additional crops. And um, I might add that the cold... Uh, hardy crops like like carrots, for instance. Carrots are a great example. I've already done three succession plantings of carrots. I'll keep going with that until the middle of July. So I'll do another two carrot plantings. So the, the thing about carrots is you want to pull them when they're really nice and young and at their peak of sweetness. If you let them go, you know they become horse carrots. And that's great if you're a horse, but it's not yeah. so great for people. And yeah. so I do a lot of uh, beets and carrots, uh, the beans, of course, because they're a short season crop. Oh, and did I mention radishes? You know, get your kids involved in growing radishes because they produce a crop from the seed to harvest in 45 to 60 days, depending on the variety and where you plant them. Lots of sun, well-drained soil, and you'll get radishes in 45 days. So think about that for a minute. It, middle of June, end of July, you're going to be harvesting radishes. Well, the, the radish crop only, you know, you only harvest your radishes for about 10 days, two weeks. So every two weeks between now and the end of July, I'll be planting, or sowing rather, uh, radishes. So I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah. And the other thing that, you know, I think people don't always realize about some of these short season crops that are grown from seed. Great point. Great way to categorize them. Um, is how late you can go. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Did we just lose Ben? I thought I just saw him disappear. Oh, there you go. Well, he's right. Um, it surprises me. And, you know, if you live near the country or you get an opportunity to drive to the country, it's kind of fun to just observe how late farmers put crops in the ground. Uh, and, and don't forget the perennial food crops, by the way. Uh, I've already harvested um, some asparagus this this season. I'm done. I will not harvest it any longer because I want it to grow, mature, and go to seed to produce more to produce more uh, roots for next year. My strawberries, Ben, are unbelievable. I planted them last year. They spread all over the garden. I got mountains of flowers, and the fruit set is so exciting. So we're going to add from my little pots of strawberries, I think we're going to end up with a, a fantastic crop. The raspberries I'm not quite as excited about. I planted last year. They're coming along. I'm, I'm predicting another two years for them. My grapes, probably four to five years. The apple trees I planted last year, probably another five to seven years before they start bearing fruit. But you need to plan for these things now. Perennial food crops require time and patience, but the payback is 
when you provide them with the patients that they need, you get this you get this incredible cropping that occurs year after year after year uh, with very little effort. All you got to do is kind of control the weeds and the bugs and Bob's your uncle. Yeah, Bob's your uncle. And, you know, I I tried the strawberries and unfortunately I share a yard with my four legged IT manager and she tore through it and my strawberry plants are reduced to mulch, which is too bad. Um, but I, I got dropped off there for a second when I was mentioning how late you can go with these things. And the yeah. key that I don't think I, I would personally, I don't think we see nearly enough of is season extension at the end of the season, right? So yeah. you could put in a really late crop of uh, carrots or lettuce or kale, whatever. And yeah. if you cover it with a polytunnel or a cold frame, you can keep that going well into November. Easily. Absolutely. Yeah, Easily. absolutely. You know who that is the master at that, Ben, for people that have joined us this morning and want to learn more is Nikki Jabour from Nova Scotia. She's, she's written um, a number of books and her favorite thing is season extension for food crops. So, yeah. it, it, so Google Nikki Jabour and uh, uh, you'll find all kinds of information there. You'll also find lots of information at markcullen.com which has the equivalent of over 5,000 newspaper columns, many of which you have written, Ben. And uh, people can go into our library and use the internal search engine to get a lot of answers to their food gardening questions there, markcullen.com. Yep, yep, that's right. Nikki Jabour is a great resource. I think her book is called The Year-Round Gardener. Mm -hmm. And um, what I love about these season extension methods is often – you don't have to spend a lot of money. I mean, gardening is one of those things. Access to a place to garden is perhaps the most restrictive thing. If you're on this call, assuming you have somewhere to garden, you don't have to spend a lot of money to go a long way with these season extension techniques. There's, you know, all you know sorts. it's funny you should mention that. In, in our library where we have our newspaper columns, there's a column about the best investment you can make. And I'm talking about money. I'm talking about a seed packet that's worth, let's say, $2. And I know... You can buy seeds for less, you can buy seeds for more. Start with a pack of seeds at $2. Take the number of seeds in the packet, multiply that by the value of the crop you're going to uh, you're going to harvest, and then the return is staggering. I yeah. don't care who your investment advisor is, nobody can give you a return that comes close to yes. the return you'll get from, from just putting some seeds in the ground. And by the way, for urban gardeners, Ben, have faith. My my advice to you is don't do the don't go to a garden center and buy a little a pot with a bean plant in it for a buck and a half. You don't need to do that because because beans grow from seed, right? Yes, that's right. And yeah. well, beans beans are seeds. <laughs> beans, and so beans are a seed. That's true. We um, we, uh, we buy we buy seed beans for the growers most years, but it's possible to what we say bin run them too, which is just planting last year's crop. Now, the reason why you might not want to do that as a farmer is that you can roll forward disease pressures that accumulate, right? So in right. Southern Ontario, it's a relatively humid climate to be growing edible beans. So those spores of fusarium or whatever can build up in your inventory and you increase the risk year after year. However, genetically, it's fully possible. And if you're managing your disease pressures low, uh, people do it. And uh, if you've got Cullen's beans seeds in your garden in a box box, that's what it is, folks. They're beans. You know, ostensibly you could eat them, soak them, and eat them. I did, we didn't treat them with anything. And you know, in the urban gardening, well, it's not just urban gardeners. It's it's all veggie gardeners. There's been this movement towards heirloom seed varieties, um, specifically for the ability to to save seed, right? And so whether it's tomatoes or what have you. Um, that that whole culture around seed exchanges is really picking up. And what I love to see, you know, you could you could lay a lot of blame on social media for various things, but I see it in local Facebook gardening groups, maybe things like the Garden in a Box Facebook group, where people are exchanging seeds with their friends, neighbors, fellow gardeners locally. And I mean, talk about a low cost hobby, right? It's a great way to meet people, great way to share the bounty, great way to learn. And um, you know, as your season matures and a lot of your 
veggie crops are going to seed, um, look at ways to, to save them and share them um, for yourself and for your neighbors. So uh, great topic, seed, seed sharing and starting. Yep, you're, you're right. By the way, I want to show you a picture. Speaking of growing some seed, um, is this what you call screen sharing? No, it's not, but um, I, I, get, I see what you're getting screen. at. You know what that is? That's a picture of my wildflower garden that I took this morning before we started our podcast. And what you're looking at is mostly poppies. Uh, and my four-year-old grandson sowed these seeds. So my message then would be, if, if my four-year-old grandson can produce this, which I agree <laughs> the resolution's not really good, I'll have yeah. to learn how to screen share properly. Uh, you can do it. Anybody can do it. Anybody it's so much it. fun. So, Dad, uh, Mr. Radish, Alicia's got a question here. It's a good question. I have the hardest time growing radishes. Uh, they seem to always bolt before I get to eat them. What might be happening? I think it's the hot afternoon sun and you're not pulling them fast enough. So you need to inspect your radishes every day. And um, when... When you see a little bit of a radish poking through the soil, it looks like the top of your thumb, like that, then um, give it a pull. And, and pull them, um, harvest them before they get into a big radish. The ones that you get at the fruit market, those, those things are strip mined somewhere in Holland Marsh or somewhere, maybe California. And don't wait for them to look like that. Get them nice and young and they won't bolt. What you're saying is they're bolting to seed. Uh, that's one problem. The other problem we all have is that they crack, uh, especially if we get inconsistent moisture, a dry period, a wet period, boom, my radishes are cracking. Um, so uh, harvest often, and if you can keep them, if you can sow your seeds where they get morning sun, midday sun, but then out of that really hot two o'clock afternoon sun, you will get a beautiful crop of radishes. And you just touched on something really interesting, Dak. We kind of, we also kind of danced around it with the question of heat units, and it's this this question of extremes, right? Like heat, heat throughout the season. Yes, it's good to get hot. It's good to have heat, but any grower would rather have a longer period of even heat than these yeah. extremes that we keep getting. And you know, these trends are only exacerbating. You know, with climate change, they say more rain, less often. What does that mean? It means downpours and droughts and that is a really important thing to adapt to as a grower and you know there's various methods you know mulching your garden generously is a really good way to deal with those massive fluctuations in moisture that you're going to get because a heavy layer of mulch is going to protect you from erosion and uh and, and flooding basically when you have uh, a heavy downpour but it's also going to retain moisture when you have those extended periods of dryness so, you know, there are adaptation methods, but the key thing is to interpret the weather as it happens and as it comes. And, you know, when we know we're going to get hot, hot heat, there's a temptation to just retire to the air conditioning, get out into the garden and see what you can save because hot, that hot, hot heat, these, these insane dry, uh, hot dry spells that we've been getting can really spoil your crop. So um, mm. to dad's point, mm. that's when things start mm. to bolt and um, maybe things haven't gotten to the size you want, you can try shade cloth or you can just get them before the sun bakes them off. Um, yeah. That's true of tomatoes. That's true of a lot of crops. So uh, adapting to the weather is really becoming a, a more significant part of, of the veggie growing experience. Well, and I, I would add one thing to that, Ben, um, and, and mulching the veggie garden, I think is a really good idea where perennial crops are, are, are uh, concerned like your asparagus, the grapes, et cetera. Um, dry periods drive roots deep. In other words, a plant wants to live. And so it, it has this ability to go deeper, seeking the moisture in the ground. When, and as the ground dries down, they will go deeper. We have to learn to resist the temptation to water during a drought, unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, with annual crops like tomatoes and all the vegetables, but it's different. But with these perennial plants, we need to learn to let them take care of themselves. You know, I have a pollinator garden and I didn't water it in the drought last year, which, which occurred from the, the end of July here in Southern Ontario to about the end of the second week of August. So three weeks of drought and extraordinary heat, I didn't water once. And I think my plants 
survived and thrived largely because I, I resisted the temptation and I learned to ignore them. Well, you make an excellent point. And that's where for perennial gardeners, which is you know not the topic of garden in a box, but for perennial gardeners, that's where planting the right plant in the right place is sure. also so essential. So, you know, yeah. there's a trend towards native plants, which is great. But you yeah. want to make sure that whatever native plant perennial variety that you're planting is site appropriate. So there's plenty of drought tolerant plants you can buy. And then to dad's point, train them to put down deeper roots by it's like raising a kid. Sometimes you got to let them suffer a little bit, right? So, well, yeah, let's put it this way. Sometimes you have to allow them to make their own mistakes. Yeah. And are sure. you there to catch them? Oh, yeah, sure. You know, but that's what band-aids are for, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's about training them to put down roots. So we might have bent that metaphor right out of shape. Uh, Jennifer Mitchell's got another great question here. What are the best mulches to use in a veggie garden? Um, there's no wrong answer. I know dad has his preference and I have mine. I'll lead with mine. Um, I prefer straw. It doesn't look as nice, but I find it's really nice to work with because it kind of mats well and it breaks down really well. Um, so it depends partly on where you live. In um, an urban environment where there's lots of arborists around, you can get bark mulch relatively cheap. And in a rural environment where there's lots of farmers around, you can get a straw bale for pretty cheap. So um, that would be my suggestion. I'm, I'm a straw mulcher. Dad, how about you? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, in favor of straw, you know, your Aunt Nora, who lives in the city of Toronto on an urban lot, ordered 30 bales of straw for her garden, not just vegetable garden, but she has a lot of vegetables indeed. Uh, and she's having a wonderful time. She's actually doing some straw bale gardening where yeah. you know, she carves a hole in the top and puts the tomato plant. That's great. The only thing I want to say about straw, you need to be cautious of when in the early days on their previous home, when we lived in the country, Ben, you'll remember when I used a lot of straw around all my tomatoes, it actually held water too well. And as a result, my tomatoes tended to get early blight earlier and more severely than when I didn't mulch them with straw. And so I do tend to favor the use of ground up cedar bark mulch. Now, this is not something you can get for free or even cheaply necessarily. You can buy it at the bag at Home Hardware or anywhere they sell mulch, um, but or by the truckload, which I buy it by the truckload. I get about 30 cubic yards of the stuff at a time, and I use a lot of it. Yeah, and there's a, there's a follow-up question to the, the bark mulch things. Why bark mulch and not just wood chips? You know, wood chips are much easier to come by, and yeah. they do serve a purpose. You can use wood chips to put down a pathway or whatever. Right. And as a, as a matter of fact, you can use them to mulch as well, but they're not ideal. And uh, to spare you a chemistry lesson, which I'm bound to botch, um, wood chips require a lot of nitrogen to decompose. So the, what ends up happening is they will pull nitrogen out of the soil, especially if you incorporate them. So that is, if you dig the wood chips into the ground, they're gonna be pulling nitrogen, which is a necessary nutrient for anything that you're growing pulling nitrogen away from the roots of your plant. So if you get a hot deal on free wood chips, consider using them for pathways. They're not an ideal mulch material. Well, it's it's hard to get a hotter deal than free, uh, true. But this is why wood chips will work okay on a fairly large shade tree because the roots of the tree are deep enough. They're not affected by the nitrogen that's drawn out of the soil by the wood chips that they decompose. But it, they don't work at all well around food plants or annual plants or even shallow rooted perennial plants. Yeah. Yeah. So there's 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 perhaps more of an answer than you're looking for, Jennifer. Um, but, you know, I see we're pretty much at time here. That's the update from my garden. Um, Dad, anything exciting elsewise that you're doing in yours? Um, staking, trellising, structure wise? Yeah. <laughs> where, where, where do I start to answer that question? I, I am, I, I am having a lot of fun, Ben. As you know, I started this garden a year ago. It's a not quite an acre. Uh, it's a little. Let's say the garden part is probably close to half an acre. And I'm, I'm having so much fun experimenting with a clay-based soil. And uh, folks, this is a. If you want to challenge yourself as a gardener, try growing vegetables in a clay-based garden. Um, I'm learning as I go, 
and perhaps on another podcast we could talk a little bit about how do you manage your soil when it's less than ideal yeah yeah no it's true well that's a whole whole other kettle of fish um and i think this is you know one shortcut solution if you can afford it is, is raised beds dad does not have yeah. half an acre of raised beds um yeah. but it you know if, if if you're stuck with suboptimal soil conditions and you don't have that much space um really raised beds are popular for a reason you can backfill with the good stuff so anyway yes and as far as you know a raised bed is a structure but when you're growing things like viney tomatoes beans etc uh, now's a good time to get your stakes on the ground, so to speak, uh, so you can start training them up. Because what well, you're going to double your tomato crop, and you're going to you're going to cause a lot fewer headaches in terms of blight uh, and so forth, because you have the air circulation going through there. So uh, something to consider this time of year. Uh, that would be my parting advice: get out there, stake your tomatoes, um, and that's what we've got. So thank you for a great chat. Happy local food week, Dad. Happy local food week. I hope. You and mom have some local food to enjoy uh, around the table. Well, happy local food week to you too. And I am blessed because I've got a local cook. So <laughs> I've got a local cook, local food, and I've got some beer in the fridge and coffee on the pot. And wow. Life is, like I said at the very beginning, life is good. It life is good. Life. Well, enjoy your month long stat holiday. <laughs> <laughs> It's a state of mind. We still have work to do. It's a state of mind. Yeah, uh, but thanks to run, well, let me know when you're on a run for uh, office. I'll I'll be your campaign manager. We'll we'll run on that platform. We'll run on that platform. Sounds good. Well, I want to say thank you to Food and Farm Care for giving us the opportunity uh, to be a part of the Garden in a Box program. Uh, if anybody wants to find us. On Facebook, Mark Cohen Canada's Gardening Guru. We have a podcast. We have a podcast. It's called The Green File. It's fun to listen to. And uh, we also have a newsletter, which you can sign up for at markcohen.com. So anyway, thank you so much uh, to everybody. And uh, that's it. That's all, folks. Happy gardening. And uh, we look forward to hearing, maybe seeing some pictures would be nice, of this Garden in a Box program. 500 gardeners. Uh, awesome. And there's Peter. I got to actually get better Peter. But I got to get a better Peter picture. <laughs> okay. We'll see you later, Dad. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye.